excited, ladies and gentlemen. This is probably the moment you've been waiting for, the interview you've been waiting for. We just fell in love with him from the minute he was born. Jeff, say a few words. I love you. Bye-bye. Every step along the way, he picked himself up and was full steam ahead. And I can always finagle my daddy into anything I want. This child was going to be a gift to us. You know, I sometimes wonder what would have happened if we never pursued the answers. And that's really Jeffrey's voice. Can't you do something? Just to clear things up, I'm Jam, Jeffrey, Alan Modell, and this is Jam Talk. I was 27, and I had started my own jewelry business. And a woman who was friendly with my parents came to me and said, I've got a number for you. So after a week or two, I called the number. And she said it very nice. And then I said, can I ask you a question? How old are you? I mean, you sound like about 12. And she said, oh, no, are you kidding? I'm 18 years old. I went to my friends, and I said, Sounds like a really wonderful girl. We had a wonderful conversation, but she's 18. And my friend said, 18 becomes 19. 19 becomes 20. 20, 21, call her back. The next morning, I went to class. I was in college, and they said, so how was the date? How was the date? I said, I'm going to marry that guy. I am so in love with him. I was completely smitten. I didn't care anymore that I was old and she was young. Nine months after their first date, Fred Modell proposed to Vicki Abrams. On September 7, 1968, the night before their wedding, Fred wrote a letter to his bride that would be prophetic. The challenge to both of us lies ahead. If there are setbacks, as I guess there must be in life, we must call on our most tremendous source of strength, our enduring love for each other. I was 21 when I first found out I was pregnant. I was so excited. It was a dream come true. September 25th, 1970, it was thrilling to me. I said, I got a son. And it was just phenomenal. He was the most beautiful, beautiful baby with these big blue eyes and had a little, little brown hair. and. He was absolutely spectacular. He was a small baby. The doctors told us he will plump up and get chubby very, very quickly, and that he was healthy. I can't wait to play ball and to take him to games and to do all the stuff that young boys like to do and, and I could share with him. He was absolutely perfect until he was 10 months old. And that's when everything started to go wrong. In the summer of 1971, Jeffrey developed an alarmingly high fever and jaundice and was immediately hospitalized. Doctors discovered that there was a problem with his immune system leaving Jeffrey dangerously vulnerable to bacteria and viruses. Worse still, doctors knew little about how to treat him. Our world was shattered. On the outside, he looked so beautiful. He was so perfect. But on the inside, his immune system was so seriously flawed that it was, they said, like a time bomb. And I said, there must be something you can do. You think, is this the only kid in the world who's got this? They told us that they were not sure about the prognosis, that maybe if we crossed our fingers and we took really good care of him, that we could be lucky and maybe he would outgrow it. Jeffrey Modell had been born with a confusing and mysterious disease called primary immune deficiency. His body wouldn't manufacture enough of the white blood cells that we all need to fight off common illnesses, which meant a cold or ear infection or pneumonia could easily and quickly become deadly. 
primary immune deficiency is when the body's immune defenses that fight battles on an ongoing basis to keep us healthy are inherently broken in some way, shape, or form. It's something that you did not get because you had a virus infection or you were on a medication. It's something that you actually were born with. We call that primary. When I was in med school, the immunology textbook was, I think, 82 pages long. It was one of the shortest ones and one of the easiest courses that we took because we knew very little. I still have vivid memories saying goodnight to him. He was perfectly fine. And then I would always fear the next morning. I almost didn't want to get out of bed and take a look at him because you could see right away if he had a fever, if he wasn't well. Despite knowing their son was in constant danger, the Models let Jeffrey live his life and adjusted to a life of uncertainty. It was great. I came home every day and I spent time with him and I threw him up in the air and we sang songs together and he was just a joyous kid with a wonderful personality. We have just finished breakfast. Mom has had three cups of coffee. We're on our way to Mamart again today. But we're not going to tape that because we don't want you listeners to get tired and leave and get bored and have no fun. Have a good day. While they enjoyed Jeffrey's healthy moments, they still had no answers for his sick ones. A void which left them feeling helpless and alone. It was extremely isolating in that we never met another family. He never met another child with primary immune deficiency. So he thought that he was one in a billion people to have this disorder. One day he said, I just wish I had leukemia because at least I would know what they could do for me or not do for me. This way, I have no answer. I have something that nobody's ever heard of. I said, whatever the cost is, it doesn't matter to me. I want to get an answer. We took Jeffrey all over the world for diagnosis. They shrugged their shoulders and said, we're just not sure exactly what it is. So you'd say, well, gee, there's got to be a better response. And these were really giants in the field. And the pain for both Fred and myself, as well as his doctors, was excruciating because he saw the best physicians in the world. He had a privileged life, a life with everything he could ever want, but we couldn't give him his health. Jeffrey's illness didn't keep the Models from wanting to expand their family, but they feared having another child born with this disease. After researching their family histories and finding nothing alarming, in 1973, Vicky gave birth to their second child, Lori. She was beautiful, very beautiful. When we brought Lori home, I noticed that she did not follow sound. I took her to the pediatrician and I said, I'm really quite frightened. I think that Lori might be deaf. He said, I wish I could tell you she was deaf but I believe that she's severely developmentally disabled. As she grew a little bit older, it became more obvious. In fact, we had doctors who said she would never walk or talk or even sit up. In life, you dealt a hand, and you're gonna have some tough stuff. A sick child, a parent who's sick, a bankruptcy, a, a, a divorce. I mean, there's so many things that can just kill you. I mean, it was, it was the two of us and two sick children. I said, we gotta figure this one out. This is a tough one, but we gotta figure this out. Lori needed 24 hour a day care. To have people living with us would be very, very difficult because Jeffrey was ill too. The Models had to make a painful decision they couldn't risk exposing Jeffrey to the germs that caregivers might bring into the house. But they wanted the best for Lori. They decided to place her in a residential facility that could provide her 
with the care she needed. But Jeffrey was very sorry to see her leave home. He adored her and always thought that she was the fragile one. I wouldn't have traded these children for any other child, but I doubted whether I would be able to have a healthy child. So I just steeled myself. I made myself as strong as I could. I had so much responsibility. And what about me? All my dreams, they were shattered. I had everything and I had lost everything at the same time. While Jeffrey always recovered from his hospital stays, they still kept coming. Fortunately, Fred's successful jewelry business provided the means to continue seeking out the most innovative treatments and the best doctors. But it was the doctors at nearby Mount Sinai, one of the most prestigious hospitals in the country, that Jeffrey and his family would often turn to for help. When I first met him, it was just a question of giving him antibiotics as he needed, and hopefully his intersections with medical care were as just as brief as once a month for a few hours. But then things became much more difficult. I had to do things and be a part of things that were not always pleasant, sticking him with needles, um, you know, doing um, spinal taps with, on him, being um, putting in chest tubes. Life was a roller coaster. Every day, we never knew what we would wake up to. I slept at the hospital with Jeffrey all the time. Barry would come in and keep me company. You got to know the parents of ICU patients, unfortunately, very well. One of our most important jobs was not only taking care of the patient, but making sure that the family were taken care of as well. The children were all asleep, but the parents were pacing the halls and wished they were home, wish we could shower. It was very lonely. I would go to work for maybe a half a day or something, then meet her up at the hospital, and we would talk and try our best to impact on this condition, but um, it was tough. I mean, we could only try the best we could do never knowing what would lie ahead, except that we had each other, Vicki and I, that we had. Jeffrey was a unique kid. As I learned in my career, a lot of children who deal with chronic illnesses tend to have a uniqueness about them. They are survivors and they push on, and Jeffrey was really the epitome of that. He would say to us, Mom, Dad, please do something. You went to college, you're smart. Please do something. Little did he know we were doing everything we could. Through it all, he thrived, he grew, we weren't going to let him live a life that wasn't normal. We made that decision early on. We went swimming here and in Europe and other places. Uh, he played squash. I was in an athletic club in New York, and we played squash together, put on the goggles, and he was hitting the ball. He was a good athlete. Uh, we played softball in the park. Of course, did a lot of boating, sailing. We went on cruises up, up to Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, and he was a great sailor. He, I mean, we gave him the helm and he was doing it. He was just never paid attention to this disease. He had courage, he had strength, and he, he, he had a very deep conviction about his doing things that he wanted to do. I think that was a big lesson for me. I was not cut out that way. He had an incredible sense of humor. He would be uh, laughing, uh, he would be performing. Uh, he would be telling jokes. Uh, you would never know in a million years that he was sick. Hi, and welcome to another edition of Jam Talk. I'm Jeff Modell, your host for this show. We did a man on the street the other day. I um, very bravely walked onto the streets of Manhattan in dark sunglasses, so of course no one would recognize me. And I just asked people that I saw on the street what they thought of our show. 
Ma'am, ma'am, wait one second. Um, can you please tell me, what do you think of the show Jam Talk? Have you, have you ever heard it? Oh, yeah, I, I've heard it many times. And uh, that, that host, uh, Jeff, Jeff Modell, he's just so sexy. Well, uh, thank you. I mean, I'm sure he'll appreciate that. In the eighth grade, Jeffrey wanted to join his classmates for their annual whale watching expedition in Cape Cod, but it would expose him to the cold and damp weather. His parents knew the risks, but refused to let the disease define him. When we went to pick him up from the trip, there he was, like all dirty and sweaty. He had his big blue eyes, but they were watery and his cheeks were bright red. He said, I had the best time of my life and I feel great. And when we took him home, it wasn't so great. And then of course he ended up in the hospital. We always pretended everything was fine. I was almost afraid that if I admitted that he was so sick, that something bad would happen. Over the next two years, Jeffrey's health began to improve. But it was a Princeton University football game in 1985 that gave the Models hope that the worst was behind them. So we went down to the Princeton game. He had brought a football. He says, come on, let's throw some passes. And he, he was really quite good. And we were throwing passes out on the football field during the halftime. He looked great. He felt great. He just was joyous. And I said to Vicky, and I never forgot this, I think it's behind him. Look at his face, rosy cheeks, bright eyes, healthy, breathing well, throwing a long pass. I think it's over. <laughs> Unfortunately, within a couple of days, he became ill. We thought no matter how bad this hospitalization was, that he would bounce back again. His uh, pediatrician said, hey, this kid's had nine lives already, and he'll have a 10th and an 11th and a 12th. Just hang in there. So it was Thanksgiving, and then we were there for Christmas Day and New Year's Day. And we started to sense we were in some real, real trouble. I said to him, I know you think it looks really bad, and you're probably scared, but it's going to be OK, because we have each other. And I saw a tear come down from one eye. And that was the last conversation we ever had. Jeffrey Modell died on January 7th, 1986. Mm. He was 15 years old. We said our goodbyes, and then we left the hospital. Fred and I just kept walking. We were just, didn't know where we were and what happened. But all of a sudden, we were back in our apartment. Um, I think we walked all the way. It was like 40 blocks. And it took a long time to realize what happened. Very long. I never was ready, because I was sure at that football game. It was a pneumonia. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. But he was an amazing kid. And he never looked back. He never felt sorry for himself. When he died, 
Fred asked me to accompany him to pick out a coffin. I don't have uh, great memories of a lot of things, but I tell you, I have an extraordinary memory of seeing 20, 30 coffins and talking to Fred, uh, should we do that one? No, let's do that one. Oh, Jeffrey would like this one. I mean, how often do you get to pick out a coffin for a 15-year-old? I went to Jeffrey's funeral. It was just amazing to me um, how normal a life he had when he wasn't ill. You can hover and keep them protected in a way that doesn't allow them to grow. And I think that, you know, in his short life, Jeffrey did the things he wanted to do because his parents allowed him to do those things. It was really quite sad that Fred and I could not say Jeffrey's name to each other. We never, ever uttered the word Jeffrey. And I just said, let's try to get through these few weeks and then take a deep breath and see what's possible. And I think that's what we did, but nothing heroic and nothing courageous on my part. Jeffrey was the guy. He was the courageous guy. Jeffrey Modell's death shattered his family. But children with primary immune deficiencies, diagnosed and undiagnosed, had been dying for years, a fact that the global medical community was just beginning to understand. In the 80s, we had very little immune deficiency-related basic science. So in order to get a grant, we would submit a grant for basic science in immunology and then try and find a way to immune deficiency. By that time, we knew a few diseases. I would say we had few patients because we had uh, very few resources to diagnose them. The mortality rate was relatively high. One meets a lot of families who've lost a child because of a primary immune deficiency. Losing any child is a devastating event. Different people react in different ways, but quite a lot of people want to do something. Your child's sniffles and earaches could be a whole lot more dangerous than you think. I mean, they could be deadly. It could be primary immune deficiency. I know you probably haven't heard of that, but I'd like you to meet a couple who unfortunately lost their child because of it. Please say hello to Vicki and Fred Modell. Good morning. Okay. You lost your son six years ago. Jeffrey was 15. How did that happen? He developed a hepatitis-like condition, mm -hmm. and it was at that point that he was hospitalized and checked further and diagnosed with primary immune deficiency. And from that moment on, he was well for long periods of time and desperately ill for many periods of time. Did they tell you at the time they made the diagnosis that this, this could possibly be fatal? That's the thing that's so hard to understand because it sounds like any number of children it must be so fres frustrating, Fred. Well, it, it's difficult, but um, what's inspired us is we've met a lot of families who, even since these past six years, are going through a lot of the same things we went through. Mm -hmm. They're isolated, they're alone, they're anxious, they're unsure, they don't know where to turn. Cousins of ours came to us 
and said that they have neighbors that lost their daughter to leukemia. And now the parents feel so fulfilled because they started a foundation in her memory. And we would like you to start a foundation and do the exact same thing they did. The year after Jeffrey's death, with the encouragement of family and friends, Vicki and Fred established the Jeffrey Modell Foundation in 1987. They had no idea if they would make a difference, but they knew they had to do something. My goal was that we would find better answers to what took Jeffrey's life. If we could prevent even just one family from that, then it would be worth starting the foundation. Our first board meeting was in June of 1987, and somebody said, one day this foundation is going to raise a million dollars. And I said, you know, we have $500 in the bank. The hope was to be able to spread the word. What would happen would be with these pediatricians who were good doctors in every way, I'm assuming, didn't catch the signs, and the signs could be subtle. The sort of brief description was always the bubble baby, John Travolta movie. The hardest part for us was to sort of get your hands around what's the definition of what we're dealing with. It isn't something concrete where you say, well, they have this and we can fix it or we can't. This was much more complex. It wasn't anything we knew about. The only thing as far as immune deficiency that we knew about was what everybody calls the bubble boy disease and it was an education. I think we all said, you know, of, of course we're on board, of course we will help you. Throughout Jeffrey's life, Vicki and Fred consulted with the greatest immunologists of the time, each of whom contributed to keeping Jeffrey alive for 15 years. And when they established the Jeffrey Modell Foundation, those leaders helped set the agenda. We decided to do a little brochure inside the brochure would talk about what primary immunodeficiency is and try to explain in simple terms what took Jeffrey's life because it was a difficult set of diseases to describe. And so we did it simply. And then we said, well, who are we going to send this to? We wrote everybody we knew and said, this is not HIV, this is not acquired immune deficiency, this is inherited genetic immune deficiency, and we lost our son. Will you help us? Maybe it was beginner's luck, but we raised hundreds of thousands of dollars in small donations. We decided to set up a fellowship fund at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York City. Despite their efforts, children were still dying doctors had few tools for treating the disease. One as a physician tries not to get involved very much with patients, but sometimes it's impossible. I remember one kid, and he developed a very severe, rare tumor, and he finally died. That was, for me, really uh, 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 incredible because it was a sensation that, that uh, I could have done more, but I did what I could. I used to work as a young resident with some babies, they are very sick. And then I cannot do anything, they die. This is a catastrophe for the family. It breaks families. It really destroys lives, not only of the kids that die, but think of a young couple. They get a baby, looks lovely, healthy. A few months, he's sick. He stays in hospitals and dies. And they get another one, and the same story happens. And they don't even understand why. I was heartbroken because I couldn't treat them. With no cure on the horizon, the foundation next focused on raising awareness. Working with a medical advisory board and the American Red Cross, the Models developed the 10 warning signs of primary immune deficiency, distributing it to pediatricians across the country. The earlier you diagnose these kids, the better their life. This is how 
physicians will recognize a patient. To think about primary immunodeficiency when there was a child or an adult suffering recurrent infections, which was not, is still not always something a doctor thinks immediately about. The 10 warning signs poster became absolutely a smash hit, not only in the United States, but every country in the world wanted to translate them. Although the campaign was a success, it wouldn't reach every family in time. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 2022 Rare Disease Week documentary screening panel discussion. My name is Tylea West, and I'm a former Georgetown University student, a rare disease patient, and an impactful advocate for the rare disease community. I feel so humbled and honored to be here this evening with our amazing panelists to discuss this year's documentary selection. Do something. The Jeffrey Modell Story, a film which focuses on the story of Jeffrey Modell, his parents, Fred and Vicki, and Jeffrey's diagnostic odyssey and life with primary immunodeficiency disorder. As someone myself who lives with hyper IgE, hearing the Modell story, their trials and tribulations through Jeffrey's diagnostic odyssey and how they made the decision to do something to help others facing similar adversity resonated so much with me. Hearing a story so similar to my own is so impactful and it's so fascinating to hear what you have gone through and the feelings that you have felt through the lens of another person's experience. With that being said, to start things off, I would like to introduce our panelists and give them a few moments to share a little bit about themselves. Let's all welcome Vicki and Fred Modell. Thank you so much for both of you being here today. Um, can you please share a little about yourselves and your experience with the film and creating a piece of this nature? Hi, Talia. We, we'd be delighted to do so. Uh, we are Vicki and Fred Modell. Um, and we are co-founders of the Jeffrey Modell Foundation. Uh, the foundation was created in 1987. So we're about 35 years into uh, the Jeffrey Modell Foundation. And we thought it was time uh, to make a film about our progress, our defeats, our successes, um, and all the um, wonderful people throughout the world um, who have helped us on our path and on this journey. So we're happy to be here today with you. And I will join in and say that it's been a great experience, a great journey. It's all been uplifting. Uh, the film shows the difficult days that we had with Jeffrey, but it also shows the wonderful days that we had with him. And he was a great athlete and had great sense of humor and uh, those of you who've seen the first 30 minutes of the film, and those of you who've seen the whole film know that that's the way it shows up. And that's really true. Um, so we're delighted to speak today about any areas that can give greater insight beyond the movie, but uh, we're very proud of the film. Thank you so much, Vicki and Fred, for sharing your initial introduction. Um, now I have a few questions from some of the rare disease community for both of you uh, that was sent to us after viewing the first half of the film. Um, viewers, please keep in mind that you can view the full film via the link available through the Rare Disease Week platform. So let's go ahead and get started with some questions. How did you grow past your own grief to become the rare disease advocates you are today, pushing for awareness and prioritizing the patient voice? Well, unfortunately, when you lose a child, um, especially a child or any loved one, you really never get past your grief. But all you can do is tell each other, we've got to move forward. We have to move forward to keep the memories alive and to fill that void in your heart, that, that empty spot with others. And that's what we have been able to do. And 
it has been so um, rewarding to know that we can do that. But the grief never goes away. But maybe that's a good thing because it re-energizes your passion and your compassion uh, to really make a difference. So um, we decided after Jeffrey passed away that we needed to find out what really took his life because medicine and science have not caught up to Jeffrey. So we created uh, the 10 warning signs and, and um, educational materials to educate physicians and the general public so that our patients could be diagnosed earlier, more accurately, and that would lead to appropriate treatment. I will only, the only thing I will add there is that once we started it, we said we had to have a, a mission and we have a mission of research, education, patient support, advocacy, awareness. Then we did newborn screening and did next generation sequencing. This is one thing leads to another and it follows the patient. It doesn't follow what we want, it's what's needed. And that's what the foundation created as a mission. And then we began to implement the mission first in New York and Boston and Seattle, and then around the world through replication. So, I mean, the patient voice is essential, as you know, Tadalia, you know that. And if the patients are too timid or their voices are too low, then we're there to speak for them. And one big, loud voice is, is the way to do it. Thank you so much for sharing your own journey um, through the grief and how you were able to um, not only carry that with you along the way, but use that to help other patients. Um, I can say as someone who has primary immunodeficiency, um, your 10 initial questions that kind of help guide the doctor and the patient towards a diagnosis, that was actually part of my own a diagnostic journey. So it means the world to me um, that I was able to meet the people who helped develop that. Oh, I'm very That's touched great. by that, extremely touched. And for okay. me, the diagnosis, it didn't come until I was 21 years old. So mm -hmm. much, oh. much later than uh, Jeffrey's, because um, I know it impacted him at a younger age. Yes, yes. Oh. Uh, Thank you for sharing that and for sharing it with all the viewers today. Well, I think those people who saw part of the film know that we are driven to one patient, one at a time. And, and you were that and, one and you patient. you were that one patient. If we could impact on you, we just want to do that twice or three times or four times or as many times as possible. But that's what we really want to do, make a difference in the life of one patient. Perfect. Wonderful. Um, the next question that I would like to ask you both is, what do primary immunodeficiency patients have to do on a daily basis to manage their disorder? Well, now that's a very big question because there are probably 450 or more genetic defects that fall under the umbrella of primary immunodeficiency. So each patient, is really very different. Their symptoms, their ability to cope um, can vary person to person. Um, but having dealt mostly with children, I would say that children are so resilient. Um, they can move and play and dream and they can do it all with fever, with headaches, with body aches. And I'm sure you can identify with some of that, Tylea. Um, but they, they get through that discomfort and then they bounce right back and they almost forget that they ever felt, felt sick in the first place. So with children, they're more resilient. Adults, it, it's a little different depending upon your defect and your phenotype, your, your symptoms. For those people who saw the first 30 minutes of the film, you could see Jeffrey never looked back about his condition or about his illness. He always was looking forward. I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to travel. I want to play tennis. I want to go sailing. I want to do uh, everything in life. He never sat back, wallowed in his self-pity. And I think That's it's a right. positive thing for right. all patients. Patients should say, I've got this, but everybody's got something. 
And what am I going to do about it? Right. And not to identify with your disease and not to, to make others identify you with a specific disease. And we never let him be defined by primary immune deficiency. He was, he was different. He, we always told him he was one of a kind because he had some rare immune deficiency. And, and he, rather, he rather liked that. He thought he was one of a kind. So that's how we see it. I completely agree with you. I know when I started treatment uh, for hyper IgE, uh, my first question was, uh, do I always have to go into the doctor? And I felt tied to the doctor's office in the hospital because I was expected to go every other week um, so, I, and I wanted to go on adventures like Jeffrey. I wanted to go to Europe with my family and um, go on cruises and be able to travel and see the world. So that was something that I knew um, as a young adult and even as a teenager who um, I was getting sick very often and we couldn't understand why. Um, I know for me, I got to the point of where I asked the doctors, teach me how to do this, like teach me how to be able to give myself the medicine. Um, I'm not afraid of the needles. I want the medicine so that way I can go do things. So Jeffrey's whole motto of do something and go do it. And um, don't be just the patient, but be who you are and be who you want to be. That really, I think, resonates with anyone in the patient community with primary immune deficiency. Great. Well, I think it takes courage, which you have. It takes uh, strength and fortitude, resilience, and I think most of all, it takes courage to, to say, I just, just let me do it. Let me be with my friends. Let me go to school. Let me travel. Let me give myself my treatment. Um, I just want to be me. And I, I admire that a lot in you. It's wonderful. Not everyone has that kind of courage. And we hope we can encourage them to have that courage. Uh, the next question that I would like to ask you is, is there anything you wish you would have done differently throughout the process of establishing the Jeffrey Modell Foundation? And what has been your greatest lesson learned while running such a meaningful organization? It's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, the, the only thing that I think we could do better, much better, is I would like to reach out in, in a greater way and make a greater impact in diverse communities, communities where there are unmet medical needs, communities where there is a lack of equal access to treatment and diagnosis and care. Um, I think we, we've, we've done it over the years, but I think we still have a long way to go. So if that's an area for us to concentrate on now, uh, we will, most definitely. You know, it, it makes me think about the things that we could have done. In the film, I'm not going to scoop the end of the film, but towards the end of the film, we have a center in Palestine, in Nablus, and we have a center in, in uh, Israel. And the patients from Palestine were in the hospital in Israel, in Tel Aviv. And Vicky and I said to one another, wouldn't it be great if we could get the doctors together and the families together? Unthinkable, a dream. But we wrote letters and we stayed at it. And eventually you'll see in the movie that they met one another, they hugged one another, the patients met the families, the families met other families. That kind of a thing it was only in one situation that you'll see in the film, but that kind of situation is something we'd love to do more and more of. Right. Families, patients, we all have everything in common. But we need to even concentrate here in the United States through our 50 states. We can do a better job. And, and, I, and I want to do that. And the patients deserve that. So... That's what we're going to do and try to make a, a difference in the quality of life. So I'll put in a plug, see the end of the film because the end of the film has these 
wonderful shots. And Vicky said, I think you said on in the film, the Palestinian mother was talking to me with her eyes. Yes. I know what you feel. I feel the same thing. Yes. With her eyes. Yes. I, I knew. I knew that she knew what I had gone through and what she was experiencing right then and there. Yeah. We know. We know just from our eyes. We've learned that through COVID with our masks <laughs> that we really can be very expressive with our eyes. With our eyes. <laughs> And you know if somebody is smiling or if they're tearful or sad or confused, you, you can see it. And um, I, I had that kind of um, communication with, with other mothers. Yes, so that's what we're going to do is go out into all the various communities, and do it equally. Thank you so much for sharing how the journey of filming the movie, um, it evolved and you not only were able to share an experience with patients and their families on the emotions of going through um, the battle with primary immune deficiency, but also um, being able to come full circle and have plans for the future. It's amazing. Um, another question I would like to ask you is how can patients work with doctors and uh, pharmaceutical companies to help push research forward? I want to take a shot at that one because sure. about, I don't know, a couple of years ago, I did a talk with a bunch of uh, patient groups and physicians. And I said, there was a movie, probably you're all too young to remember the movie. It was called Five Easy Pieces and it starred Jack Nicholson. But it was a way to remember the five pieces. And I say that any patient organization or patient that wishes to advocate should think in terms of other patients and families, physicians and hospitals, government, pharmaceuticals, and industry, uh, and, and, the and, and the media. You need all five pieces. You can't just start with the doctor and say, I want to change the way in which research is done. I want to change clinical outcomes. I want to change diagnosis. You need all of the pieces together, the five easy pieces pulled together. And I believe in that, and we still do that. And I think that there's nothing wrong with saying at some point, because we, do, we have an economic study as well, of the cost of care, self-interest, self-interest to the Congress, self-interest to the NIH and the CDC, and governments around the world because it's in their interest and our interest to get patients diagnosed early, not to wait 20 years, but to be diagnosed early and managed and treated. That's what we believe in. Yeah. It's humane and it's economical, both. I think you make a very good point about the five pieces um, needed to push research forward of uh, something that I noticed uh, during the past two years is that uh, patients living with this rare disease were not included in research studies for vaccinations and efforts in protecting this community um, from the COVID-19 pandemic. So I think that's definitely something that we as a community of uh, people who support primary immune deficiency patients um, could definitely see advocating for not only with our physicians to be included, but policymakers, the NIH, uh, because our lives matter too. Every life is important um, and can benefit from this research. Yes. yes, beautifully said. Yes. So uh, going back to your documentary, this documentary brings to light one of the difficulties of advocating and getting resources for rare disease patients. How do you work to change the argument of, well, this is rare, not many people are affected? That, that's a tough question. So when we first started the foundation, um, we had the opportunity to testify in the House of Representatives and the Senate in Washington. And I noticed 
in my first testimony that when I used the word rare, everyone's eyes glossed over. They lost interest. They started to look down and read whatever was in front of them. And I think we learned early on at that time not to use the word rare. So what we would say is that primary immunodeficiency is an umbrella term for many, many disorders. There weren't 450 then, um, but for many disorders, some of them being very rare and some of them more common than we think. And so that was how we did it. But now times have changed and the pharmaceutical industry and the government, the NIH, the CDC, um, all the different agencies and FDA are really very interested in rare disease because I think that they're finding that treatments for a rare disease population may also have tremendous benefit for another population of, of people with a more common disorder. Um, I guess in, in laboratories, they call it serendipity, where a, you know, a treatment is found and that they find it's better for something they never even thought of. Um, so I think that um, today we can use the word rare and I think it has a different meaning. And I think we know a lot more about um, rare diseases and how many there are, like 7,000 or more. Um, and maybe some of them are not as rare as we think because we don't know the prevalence. Like we may not know the prevalence of hyper IgE syndrome. We may not at this point, but through registries and data and other materials that we get from our physicians, um, we, we can know better. And one day we will know, which will help the next generation of patients too. You know, in those very early years of the foundation, one of the senators introduced us to Dr. Fauci. And Dr. Fauci said, uh, we said it's a rare disease and nobody's gonna pay attention to this. He said, you're right that there are many rare defects, but taken together, one to 2% of the US population, now that's a lot, are affected by an underlying primary deficiency yeah. disease and 95% of them do not know they have it. They're just sick all the time. They're sick too much. They miss too much school, too much work, too much uh, illnesses and, and on that diagnostic journey. Um, I think that's an important point. And I think you always have to match it up with the costs. Yeah. We know our costs, but there are other disorders which have a cost of not diagnosing and not managing and not treating. And how much does that cost the, the government? It could be the a European government, and it could be an insurance company, it could be a state uh, agency. But to not treat, to not diagnose, let's just put them into the emergency room and see what happens. That's not smart. And so you have to have the economics because we've been to members of Congress and staffers, and they said, this is wonderful and you're doing a good job, but what's the cost of this? We have to know the cost. Yeah. So I would urge all of us to make sure we concentrate on that. But the cost of not trading is a lot greater, yeah. sadly. And we know that the government uh, puts a value on every, on every life. And uh, that value is about $10 million. So it's very important to get uh, patients diagnosed and treated um, so that they can contribute to society. So, and they will. Your statement on how the drugs or treatments developed for patients living with primary immune deficiency can also impact other disease states and conditions that aren't as rare and have higher prevalence. Um, I have seen in my own medical journey, I receive two antibodies that were created. One was created for chronic idiopathic urticaria and the other was created for oh. severe asthma. And I actually started one two weeks ago that just got FDA approved 
Um, so I know what it's like to directly benefit um, oh. from a program that was meant to help another community and disease state, but it ended up helping my disease. So I think it's very important, like you said, to remind policymakers and the pharmaceuticals that um, even treating the symptoms and some of the problems of a rare disease um, can end up making a change for patients um, who are highly impacted. So for instance, I know one of the antibodies I receive, one in four people have asthma in the United States. So that helps not only the rare disease community who might have high eosinophils or high IgE, but also yeah. helps 25% of the US and that's a huge impact. Huge. That's a good point. That's a wonderful story. Thank you for sharing that. I learned something new. It's wonderful. So that, that made my statement true. <laughs> good. good. I feel like the conversation between us is very special because I'm able to see how the things that your organization has done and even the life of your son, how that's impacted me several years later, even the things that your family did before I was even born, it changed my life and I truly appreciate it. We appreciate your beautiful words. Thank you for saying that, Tylea. And um, we we do wish you great health, and you're a sweetheart. So, thank you so much again. And in the same breath, the documentary also touches on the importance of earlier diagnosis, like you mentioned. Can you tell us about the importance of early diagnosis as it relates to primary immune deficiency and what efforts you made to promote this through your work with the foundation? Okay, the, that's a question I love. So earliest possible diagnosis has been our mantra and our, our mission since we started, because we know that the earlier a patient is diagnosed, we can prevent, first of all, that diagnostic odyssey of needless tests, wasteful resources, permanent organ damage in some cases, and of course, the pain and suffering of the patient and their families. So we created the 10 warning signs, which you so beautifully um, referred to, and other educational materials like a, a public service advertising campaign, which has been throughout the country. Um, and uh, we've uh, attracted a lot of people um, to our website because of it. And a newborn screening for skin, which Fred and I worked on for 10 years before it became a reality. And of course, that's the ultimate earliest diagnosis right at birth. And uh, now we have a program, a very active program in genetic screening, which we have given as a gift to our Jeffrey Modell Center's network worldwide. And so now we're diagnosing um, children and adults accurately. And, uh, then we have to be sure that they have access to the appropriate treatments and enough treatment to, uh, to care for their disease. So, and then we have, we have about 30 programs we run here at the foundation, um, many of them educational for both physicians and the general public. Yeah. Well done, Vicki. Thank you. <laughs> It's excellent to hear how robust of an impact your foundation has had on changing the outlook of the pathway from diagnostics all the way to treatment because the sooner patients get access to understanding what's going on, I feel like whatever the diagnosis is, it's the whole idea, knowledge is power. So I think we really need to shape that any diagnosis um, is powerful and important. It can be scary at times, but yes. I think if you're finally giving the patients and their family back the power to do something. Um, what is one thing that you hope viewers get out of this documentary? So 
we hope that the documentary shows how optimistic Fred and I are and how hopeful we are for the future. So no matter where we are, no matter where we live, no matter how we live, no matter what kind of family, parents all have the same, same hopes and dreams for their children. No matter how old their children are, even, even your age. And that hope and that dream is to have healthy and happy children. So I hope that people can see in the documentary that we have turned a lot of tears into laughter, that we've brought a lot of light into darkness, and that we've changed fear into wonder and awe. And that is something I hope people will see in the documentary because that's who Jeffrey was and still is because that's how we carry his name in the Jeffrey Modell Foundation. Nicely said, Vicki. And I would add that we, we want one patient at a time, which we talked about, and one mission at a time. We can't wander all over a whole bunch of different lanes. We have to make sure that we stay clear as to what we want to get accomplished and direct it and do our homework and go in and have a, yes. an answer to the question. We addressed a group of patient groups about two or three weeks ago, not that long ago. And they all had gone to the FDA and they all got wonderful receptions at the FDA, but nothing happened. They just got good receptions. Not yet. No, nothing happened yet. But you have to know what it is you're asking for. Have you done your homework? Have you brought in the metrics? Have you brought in the, the reasons to do it? Have you brought in the economics? You've got to do that homework. And then I think tremendous efforts can be accomplished one at a time. Exactly. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I like your focus of one person at a time, one mission at a time. And together, when there's a whole community um, who's focused like this, we can get a lot done. Yes. Um, so your family's journey with primary immunodeficiency is very relatable to so many rare disease patients and families. And meeting others who understand what life is like can feel like finding a family you didn't know you had. What are your feelings and reactions to seeing so many different rare disease advocates come together for events like this week's Rare Disease Week? I, I am so impressed with how many rare disease advocates there are. And I think it's extraordinary um, to have such strong voices out there um, sharing their stories and sharing their hopes and dreams. So it makes, it, it, I personally, it makes me feel safe. And as a patient, I think I would feel safer and I feel reassured. And I think it's empowering. And I think we can all learn from one another and can lean on one another when we need to. And there are times when families will need to do that. Um, so to me, it's, um, it's, it's very empowering and, and I love it. And it has given me tremendous energy and uh, re-energized um, our spirit and, and our mission and our goals um, and meeting you as, as well. Um, we will always remember this with you. And um, in summary, I think that we can do something even more powerful when we do it together. And that's what I think we need to do. So I hope, um, I hope we've made an impact on at least one life today. Um, and I hope that um, we make an impact on every life. Thank you so much for sharing 
that. I feel the same way. Being part of events like Rare Disease Week allows me to not only better understand myself, but it's allowed me to connect with wonderful people um, like you, Vicki, and Fred. Uh, if I can finish up, uh, I'd like to say that's a wrap of all of the questions that we had today for the documentary. Thank you so much for both of you being part of today's panel discussion and for sharing your experience with the community. I would like to invite everybody viewing today to watch the remaining portion of Do Something, a Jeffrey Modell story. The link for the full film can be found on this Rare Disease Week platform page below. Finally, if you're participating in Points for Advocacy, the Rare Disease Week scavenger hunt, a series of challenges throughout the week where you can earn points towards a potential grant for your rare disease organization of choice. The code for participating in the documentary screening and panel discussion is rare, R-A-R-E, doc, D-O-C, 2022. So rare doc, 2022. Navigate to the gamification section of the platform and find the documentary screening and panel discussion. Challenge, click the challenge, enter the code RAREDOC2022, then click submit to earn your points. Thank you again for joining everyone and we look forward to seeing you throughout this year's virtual Rare Disease Week on Capitol Hill.